Welcome to the podcast for the Wizarding School for Composers. I'm your host, Dr. Joseph Soa, and as a composer and educator, I've seen firsthand how transformative the right tools and ideas can be for creative growth. Join us each week as we demystify the craft of composition with expert guests and explore new approaches to enhance your creativity, productivity, and joy. Whether you're a seasoned composer or just starting out, this is the podcast for you. My guest today is Dr. Matthew D. Nielsen. Matt is a conductor, composer, baritone, producer, and sound engineer based in Los Angeles. As a conductor, he has led performances in notable venues, Norwich Cathedral, St. Giles in the Fields, and Cheongyu Art Center in South Korea. He's also the founder and artistic director of Utah-based professional choir Brevitas. In addition to leading Brevitas, Matt has performed with many notable ensembles, including Seraphic Fire, the Los Angeles Master Chorale, the Canara Ensemble, and the Bach Collegium San Diego. As a composer, Matthew has received numerous commissions, including from the Barlow Endowment for Music Composition. His music is published by Peter's Edition, Wal Walton Music, and Santa Barbara Music Press, and has been featured on Performance Today with Fred Child. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It's good to see you, Joseph. Yeah, it's great to see you too. We've known each other now for how long? I mean, it, this, is this maybe an embarrassing question to ask? Because I think it's been literally 20 years, right? Wow, we have known each other. Yeah, coming up on 20 years this fall will be 20 years that we've known each other. Yeah. Wow. Well, happy 20 year friend anniversary coming up soon. Happy 20 year friend Oh, wow. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, I, I didn't actually put a number to it until you mentioned it just now. But yeah, we met, we met our freshman year at BYU in the opera chorus. That was a good time. That was a good time. Now, here's the, here's the question. Do you remember the opera? I do remember the opera. It was a very niche opera. I mean, for those of you, most of the, most of my listeners will know the Book of Mormon musical, but this was actually an opera that was based in something that's in the actual Book of Mormon itself. Yeah. yeah. Has that been performed since? I have no idea. Neither do I. <laughs> Neither way. But it was a really cool experience watching a brand new opera come to life and to be part of that. And of course, to meet people like you. Yeah, likewise. And it's been, I, you know, for me, one of the fun things, in addition to, you know, being friends, one of the fun things of, uh, you know, having all this time with our friendship is just watching you continue to put on all of these hats and, you know, develop all these talents and, and achieve all these awesome things. I mean, when I first listed out your bio, I mean, we had conductor, composer, baritone, sound engineer, like all these, all these different things. And so the question that I wanted to start out with was, so you majored in recording engineering at BYU, right? That was my undergrad. Yeah. Which, you know, but just for our listeners was in the music department because the powers that be wanted engineering to be seen more as an art and more as an art related to music than as a science, which is, you know, both it's an art and a science. Yeah. So you did that and then you got your master's in choral conducting from BYU and followed that up with a doctorate in choral conducting from USC's program. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The doctorate in choral music from the University of Southern California. I guess there are two USC's. There are. Yeah. I actually was yeah. talking to someone who went to the University of South Carolina and he made it known to me that the University of South Carolina was founded before the state of California was even a state. So yeah, that distinction is very important to some people. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy for them. At some point, the two USC's need to face off on the football field and then they can have, you know, some sort of battle for which is the true USC. I think that that needs to happen. I agree. I think that there needs to be an, a USC only rivalry. Absolutely. So anyway, coming back to it. So you started with recording engineering, moved into choral conducting. How exactly did you get into composing? I actually have been composing since I was in high school because... Uh, in high school, that's where I thought, okay, I think I do want to learn more about music. And I never really took piano lessons long enough to learn about music theory. So I went to a music teacher uh, in the area who also taught piano and took just music theory lessons from her just to catch me up on some some ideas about music theory and harmony that I wasn't aware of. And, and her homework was to write compositions that was you know even from the very beginning you know the very first lesson was you know this is tonic this is dominant this is subdominant with those three chords in mind go 
write a composition, you know, write a four bar composition, write a six bar composition. And every piece of homework in music theory was always tied to the exercise of composing. And I really, you know, got bit by that bug. So composing has been a part of my musical journey since almost the beginning, at least as far as theory is concerned. And being in ensembles and being part of productions that allowed me to, you know, perform compositions and see how compositions were constructed sort of from the per perspective of a performer allowed me to sort of take it apart in a different way and then inspired me to keep writing and writing, okay, there's a, you know, let's write a hymn now. Let's write a hymn with, you know, uh, part writing rules and, and principles that, you know, are taught in basic music theory. Okay, now let's start looking at styles, you know, that are, you know, post-tonal. Let's start looking at styles that are impressionist and post-impressionist. And let's start looking at that and just keep writing and keep writing and keep writing. And doing it mostly for fun, doing it mostly for my own edification, my own, my own enjoyment, not necessarily for the idea of, okay, I want to compose something to be performed even, or let alone to be published or let alone to be you know, distributed to different places. That's where my composition journey has evolved from. And in my undergrad, being part of BYU Concert Choir and BYU Singers, it's really inspiring to sing for those, sing in those ensembles and to think, well, what if I actually wrote for this ensemble in mind? So I started writing compositions and taking them to, you know, Professor Hall and taking them to Dr. Staley and saying, what do you think about this piece? Is this something that you think that concert choir or BYU singers would ever want to perform, you know, and they would give some feedback and pretty detailed feedback and, and really honest and in many ways, brutal feedback. And then one day I took a composition to Ron Staley and he went through it and he said, I really, really like this. I have, is, has, is anyone else committed to performing this? And I said, no. And he said, well, we would love to do it. I would love to do it with BYU singers this Christmas. And that was midnight clear. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I find it interesting just because in, in many ways your, uh, your composition training was unconventional, at least in relation to what many people do. Uh, you know, many people, if they want to become a composer, they study music composition. And so uh, you mentioned Ronald Staley and, and Rosalind Hall as mentors. What other resources and mentors did you find useful as you were, um, you know, essentially studying composition on your own, it sounded like? I mean, I, I had mentors who specialized in music theory, like Dr. Durham and uh, Dr. Hicks, you know, at, uh, at BYU, where we both attended. But it's honestly, some of the best mentorship that I got was from the conductors of these ensembles, because they are very particular about, I mean, they both had composition training, even though they're choral conductors, but they, they had a really interesting perspective about what makes a good, you know, composer composition. Honestly, also just, you know, looking at the things that we were studying in music theory, in music history, one of the best uh, things that that uh, Dr. Hicks told me was when I, I was, you know, I brought a composition to him. He said, I really think that you need to go through Joscan's Ave Maria Viego Serena. I really feel like you need to use Joscan as a model in in this. And and he, you know, brought out a copy that he had in his office and said, this is, the, the, look at these things that Joscan is doing. These are some things that I think that you are missing in your, in your composition. This is something that I think you need to consider in your composing. This is something that is a model that you can look to. And then also studying with, you know, the organ professor at BYU, Dr. Bush, where, uh, who has since passed, where he would say, look at this, look at these compositions by, uh, by Bach, look at these compositions by Handel, look at these compositions by B Vivaldi. And this is look at these examples this is something that you can ins that you can incorporate into your own music so i for me a lot of my mentorship and resources came through really unconventional means yes through people who study composition and theory you know that's their bread and butter but also people who work in places that you think you know that are a little bit unconventional like you know choral music and organ yeah well i want to take this in two different directions uh, i'm just going to say them just this is going to be placeholder and we'll we'll take one at a time one is, you know, essentially with these mentors, you had to find them yourself. So I want to start off with the direction of, you know, what gave you the, what gave you the courage or how did you go about finding these mentors? And then the second direction that I, I want to take it uh, has to do with 
uh, your experience, particularly with choirs. So let's start with the first one. I mean, you weren't doing a music, you weren't doing a composing degree. Why did you, or what made it such that you could just approach these people? Part of it was just because I was enrolled in classes that they had offered. And then after I had, you know, gone through their coursework and, you know, done the assignments, I would ask them, can I come to you during office hours and show a composition to you? Would that be okay? Always asking upfront, would, would you be available to, to do this? Would you be available to offer this advice during your, during your office hours? And professors, you know, are generally off, you know, are pretty lonely during their office hours. So like, yeah, absolutely. Come by, come by and, and, you know, send me a composition early or even just, you know, bring the composition the day of. Yeah. That's kind of how I was able to get those mentorships was I did have a relationship. I did have a formal study with them beforehand and then was able to go to them later. Same thing with um, Morton Lauritsen. You know, I was sat in on his choral arranging class and then I was able to take formal lessons with him later because of that. And I was able to, you know, have been able to reach out to him, you know, occasionally since then, not so much since he retired, but uh, that's, you know, how a lot of these mentorships, men mentorships happened was starting with a form more formal setting and then asking, would you be available? Yeah. I think that this is a lesson. I, I'm just, I just want to point this out just for listeners, just to say that this is a lesson that, yes, it's easy to do in college because, you know, you have all of these people that are part of your university, but the basic framework of, you know, meet someone, develop a relationship with them. It, it works just as well outside of college. I'm actually curious, do you have any examples of that, of, of mentors that you found outside of the university setting? Outside of the university setting? I, to be fair, no, not that I can think of. Most of my mentors have come at the university setting. I mean, I would say, you know, in a conducting setting, I have been able to work with certain conductors, it, it, even though, you know, maybe I wasn't hired into their choir. I never sang in their choir, but it was able to sort of meet them and talk with them outside of that. You know, that I've been able to do that through um, choral organizations like the American Choral Directors Association or ACDA, um, which is a great networking tool for choral directors uh, across the United States and a great a great place for composers to go and if they you know if they want to you know connect more and network more with uh, choral conductors so at, at least at least with composing not so much outside of the academic framework but conducting yes singing yes okay well that does actually lead me to the second part of this question <clears throat> is that you have you know sung in one of the best college choirs in america and then also in some of the best professional ensembles in north america and so i'm curious you know what are some of the lessons that you've learned about composing from singing in these choirs that is a whole book on its own that's a that's a huge conversation i am extremely extremely blessed and very fortunate to be able to have worked in these incredible ensembles with incredibly talented colleagues and very skilled and adept conductors who, you know, are very discerning and also very picky as far as choral music is concerned and really picking music that's built with craft or built with a singer in mind and also being able to sort of identify maybe where a composition will have, you know, a weakness in it and be able to show the musicians how to overcome that weakness. That has been an invaluable lesson in learning okay, you know, what makes a good composition? What are the, what are the parts to it? Well, you know, what, for, first of all, what are the good compositions? Second of all, what makes it good? Third, being able to just, just experience that on my own, not necessarily from the conductor, but being able to experience on my own, okay, this was hard to sight read. Why was it hard to sight read? Or this was easy to sight read. Why was it easy to sight read? This is easy to sing. Why? This is difficult to sing. Why? What makes this easy to tune and what makes this hard to tune? Being able to do that over the course of, you know, even just one year, just one year, you learn a lot, multiple years, multiple decades, you really start to, you know, almost get a secondhand knowledge of uh, this. This is how the choral idiom really works, you know, and I, I continue to learn and continue to be surprised whenever I get a composition or I sometimes look at a composition and I like I, I. You know, I mean, for example, there's a there's a work out there um, called Path of Miracles. It's composed back in 2005. It is the it is the piece de jour right now in professional choral ensembles and and collegiate, really high collegiate ensemble singing. And it's for 17 parts, five sopranos, four altos, four tenors, four basses. And when you look at it, it's incredibly demanding. 
there's some really, really big singing. There's high singing. There's there's lots of lots of things going on. And when I looked at it, I was like, how is this possible? How is this even singable unless you are tenebra? And then I actually conducted it and I was like, oh, this is actually kind of easier than it looks. Why? Why is this? Why does this look so hard on the page? And why is it actually not as difficult as it is? And then I've also sung it and same thing happened. It's actually not as difficult as it is. It's, I mean, it's a challenge. Don't get me wrong. It is a challenge, but it's not the impossible sort of Everest that I imagined it to be when I first looked at it. So I'm continuing to learn all the time. That's awesome. So just for people who want to check that piece out, who's the composer of that again? Oh, sorry. Composed by a British composer named Joby Talbot. So uh, Joby, G-J-O-B-Y, Talbot, T-A-L-B-O-T, Talbot, I think. I should not have volunteered my spelling skills on camera for posterity. <laughs> well, you know, that this is what Google is for, is it's smart enough that it can figure it out. Or you can type in Path of Miracles Talbot, and it will, it will give you the right answer. Yeah, absolutely. So just backing up a bit. In your musical career so far, if you were to assign percentages to, you know, the different hats that you've worn, like, you know, maybe 20% composer, 40% performer, whatever conductor, like how much, how much time do you, would you say that composing has played in your musical life? Overall, I would say giving a rough percentage, 15% perhaps. It depends on the time of year. It depends on the year of my life. I would say this year, you know, I would say 50% of my life is composing right now. But overall, since I, you know, since we first met 20 years ago, I would say probably 10, 15% overall. But, you know, it, like, like I said, it does depend on the year. That makes a lot of sense. Well, I, I asked that because I know that some people who are listening will have been in your boat, been in the same boat as you, where like, you know, they may have done some composing, but it's not the primary thing that they've, not the primary focus that they've had. And the question I'd ask is, what would you say to people in that situation? What would you say to musicians who've primarily been performers, but who are interested in composing more? I have to say, I feel like there are so many performers, so many of my colleagues who, when they find out that I compose, they kind of lean over and whisper, I kind of wish I could do that. I kind of wish that I could compose. And I always encourage them, you, you can, you don't have to devote your entire life to composition in order to make it happen. I mean, there are some years when like I did zero composition, you know, but one of the best piece of advices that I got about composing actually came from Tarek O'Regan, who is honestly, if you haven't met Tarek O'Regan or reached out to him, he is one of the best humans like I have ever met. He is just a really, really wonderful person and really encouraging. He said to me, my goal as a composer, and he's a full-time composer, my goal is to write one measure every day. A minimum one measure every day. Doesn't even have to be a good measure. Doesn't and that measure may not exist tomorrow, but write one measure every day at a minimum. Because after 30 days you've written 30 measures. You know, and very often when you write one measure, you can say to yourself, you know, actually, I feel like I have a second measure in me or I have a third measure or I have a fourth measure. And suddenly maybe you've written 50 measures in one day, but that's, that's what he said to me. And that's probably one of the best pieces of advices I've gotten. It's also um, something I think that Dale Trimbor talked about in her book where she says, you know, you've got to write at least something every day, or even just to be involved in your compositions every day. So as someone who doesn't do composing every day, being able to do just one measure or just being able to just sort of like live in a composition every day is the best thing for continuity to make it happen, you know, even when it's not your full-time or even part-time uh, occupation. That's great. Well, I'm actually, I love this, but I'm also going to push back on it a, a little bit because, you know, you said there have been some years where you've done zero composition. So how do you square those things? Yeah. I mean, those are, uh, times when I would probably say, you know, on the list of things that I am conductor, composer, baritone, you know, that order has shuffled a lot over the years and probably those years, that's where maybe composer was a little bit lower. And I have sort of come to this through this idea of, you know, this imposter syndrome, like, uh, no, I'm a conductor first, or I'm a, I'm a baritone, you know, I have written some compositions and I, but I'm not really a composer. And you and I have actually talked about this several times over the past 20 years where I kind of lean in and say, like, I don't really feel like I am a composer. I 
feel weird putting that in my bio. I feel like an intruder. And in some ways, I don't feel like I really belong in a composer's club. And the more that I have thought about that and talked with you and talked with others, the more I've just thought, you know, I have composed, though. Even if I don't compose every single day, I'm still a composer. I don't sing every day. I'm still a baritone, right? I don't conduct an ensemble every day, but I'm still a conductor. And even if the amount that I do, you know, is maybe less or more on a given day, I still am that thing. I still am that thing. So, you know, even, even though those, uh, there were a few years when I really wasn't composing very much at all, I still am a composer. Now, should I have let myself go that long without composing? I probably shouldn't have. I probably should have actually, you know, composed a measure every single day. But sometimes I, I will say, you know, at that point in my life, composing uh, choral music, I was doing it in a situation where it really was a little bit more of a, a, a pain point in my life where I was doing it and I, you know, could hear a couple of critics voices in the back of my mind and I couldn't quiet that for a long time. So I did stop composing during that time just to let those voices quiet, you know, and when I was able to do that, then I was able to get back into the practice of do one measure a day. Uh, out of curiosity, when was that, that period of time? <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to give away too much to, to certain, to, but uh, yeah, it was, it was during a point when there was, I, I would say there was a lot of, uh, a point in my life when there was an excessive amount of unhelpful criticism in my life, an excessive amount of unhelpful criticism that was sort of all piling up at the same time. And I needed to take a break from doing any of those things. Well, that's totally fair. Well, let's talk about one of your actual compositions. I mean, we're talking about composing in general. One of the pieces of yours that I really admire is Stars Over Snow. This is your setting of Sarah Teasdale's mm. poem, Night. And I think it's just such an interesting composition, just the way that it brings together, it brings together this like freely coordinated a rhythmic almost choral gestures and it creates almost like the atmosphere of the poem more than it is worried about the delivery of the words and so I, I wanted to talk about that and just start off by asking well what's the story of how this piece came about this piece came about um because uh ron staley approached me and said i am taking BYU singers to china and i would like to take a composition a new composition with me specifically for BYU singers, you know, you should apply to the Barlow Endowment and um, see if they'll, they'll help pay for it. So I applied and they, you know, agreed. And so I started working on it and we were talking about, okay, what can we take to China that is maybe not too heavy on, with a text that's not too long and not too narrative heavy, something that is a little bit easier to translate into Chinese. And um, we actually... You know, th this is a also an example of, you know, getting an idea working because the original idea that we had was actually to take eight words, eight individual words, and to do sort of choral textures and gestures that sort of reflected that word and just go through those eight words. And, you know, the idea that we came up with eight was because eight apparently in, I think, certain Chinese culture, certain parts of China, uh, eight is a very lucky number or a very good number and so i started writing some sketches and ron wanted to see some and and normally i don't send some don't, don't send sketches early to a conductor if they ask for it but because i trust ron so inherently i sent them to him and we had a really honest conversation about the direction that the composition was going and and maybe this wasn't working in the way that he imagined or the maybe the way that it would work that would be successful for uh, the ensemble and so we said okay that's fine we scrapped the idea a little bit and he suggested this Sarah Teasdale poem that I knew and was familiar with. I actually have a friend. You actually, you and I both have a friend who set this text 15 years ago. And I was like, I, I immediately was a little hesitant because I said like, oh, but you know, this guy already did a setting of that. And he said, yes, that's fine. People do multiple settings of words all the time. You can, you know, just take a look at it, see if it works. And, and I, you know, had an idea right away that sort of, I think, was a little bit more in line with what they were looking for. And yeah, I also had recently talked with a friend named Gabriel Crouch, who is the professor of choral studies at um, Princeton 
University, who was also a member of the King Singers and has sung with a bunch of really prestigious choral ensembles. He, you know, has got a really key eye on, on composing. I sent him some some compositions in the past, and he said, you know, you you were really good at writing choral gestures, and even gestures that sort of like are programmatic and sort of reflect, you know, the sort of paint the idea. But I think that you need to you know, you're, you're going from idea to idea to idea to idea. And I feel like you need to write some compositions that are a little bit more, that, that aren't so through composed to have a little bit more of callback, a little bit more relation to each other. And this composition was very much my attempt to, okay, how do I do that? How do I stay true to who I am, which is very much a gestural composer? And then how do I make sure that things are related a little bit more tightly to each other? And so what was your, what was your solution to that? How, how did you go about approaching that? I mean, the piece for me is kind of two halves, two repeating halves. You know, there is a, you know, uh, the, the intro is sort of soft and meditative and is, is a little bit more, uh, I won't say pointillistic, but maybe a little bit more sparse, a little bit more a color here, a color here, a color here, a dr- and all based on a drone. And that happens in the first part. And then the second part picks up with a, uh, uh, a motion, a, a sort of, um, for lack of a better, better word, like, like a, a repeating motion, a gesture, an ostinato. That's the word, ostinato, leading up to a sort of mini climax. And then going back to that drone with a little color here, or there, a little color here, or there, a little color here, or there. And again, going back into an ostinato, going back into a driving, a driving motion leading up to a larger climax. So essentially having, having the same thing, having the same thing basically repeated again with a few changes sort of like a, a like a like an aa form with the second a has variations yeah like an aa form aa form of variations or just abc abc again yeah well one of the things i think that strikes me about uh about the piece is in the form it's in, in some ways it reminds me of like a of like you know movies from the you know, I don't know if, how much you, how familiar you are with like, you know, movies from 1930s and 40s. Like I've, I've watched a whole bunch of old movies and you know, that thing where they'll like, they'll take you to the story and they'll lead you to the climax and things will be solved. And then they'll just stop the movie right there. Whereas in like a, whereas in like a contemporary movie, it's like, okay, well you solve the problem, but what happens next? What's like the, you know, what, what happens afterwards? I feel like, uh, stars over snow kind of does this is, you know, you bring it to the final climax and there, it, it leads us to this moment of clarity uh, in the music and then it's done. Yeah. I, I think it's a really fascinating, uh, I think it's a really fascinating formal approach. Yeah. You know, Ron Staley is big on form. And that was probably the thing that I got most from him as a conductor was just analyzing the form of a composition, which of course influenced the way I composed. Um, but yeah, that's sort of like, you know, there's different ways that you can do an ending. And that's very much like a, like a Thelma and Louise driving off a cliff sort of ending, you know, just like, just, all right, we're going to wrap, wrap, wrap up. And then it's gone. Yeah, no, I, I think it's interesting. So that was a piece that you wrote about a decade ago at this point, right? Was it 2015, 2016? It's probably like 2015. Yeah, we're coming up with like seven, eight years. What are you working on right now? You said that you're composing for about 50% of the time. Yes, I am working on a composition, a uh, a commission f- um, for a multi movement choral work, um, a cappella, that's based on the Songs of Solomon, mm. which is a uh, for those not familiar with the Songs of Solomon, it's sometimes called, sometimes referred to as the Song of Songs. It is a book in the Bible of love poetry that goes from very. You know, it, it goes in tone from very sentimental to very erotic and it, uh, and covers lots of things in between, but poems of love, poems of intimacy, poems of, com- of compassion, poems of, uh, unconditional acceptance. And I am setting, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not doing it in order that it's in the Bible and I'm sort of just taking little little verses here and there and and combining them in such a way that I feel like is going to share a narrative that um is really really close to my heart. One of the things that um that we talked about uh the commissioning ensemble when we uh the conductor from the commissioning ensemble when we were talking about this idea um I said I want to set the song of Solomon 
And this is, this is a conductor who knows me very well. And he said, okay, that, that sounds like a really good idea. Um, and I said, I don't know if I want to write them in Latin or if I want to write them in English, because, you know, you got some pretty graphic imagery in there. Maybe, maybe it's better to put that in Latin. So it's a little bit more, you know, those who know, know what it, know what it means. It's kind of like listening to Carmina Barana. If you know what they're talking about, you know, but if you don't know what they're talking about, it's just, it's just a fun time. And he said, I think that you should write this composition. And I think that you should write it as, from the perspective of, from coming out as, as a bisexual Mormon. And I think that you need to write it in English. I don't think you need to, don't hide behind Latin. You need to really, really, really be, uh, sort of like lay yourself, just be incredibly vulnerable with this composition. And he was, he was spot on with that. And I've been writing, you know, some, some things that I'm really, really, really proud of. So I'm ordering the text and ordering the narrative in a way where we're talking about, you know, going from sleeping to going to waking, you know, going from sort of self-doubt to self-awareness. And there's a, there's a line in the Songs of Solomon that I'm using and that I'm ha putting at the very end, which is, I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? What, what is it about that line that's special to you? Well, just this idea of when I was in the closet, you know, I mean, when you and I first met, I was presenting very, very straight and I, you know, was in the closet and I was terrified, terrified of being discovered who, for who I actually was. And I was terrified that if people knew, if people knew they would stop loving me or they would never love me ever. And that was a really terrifying and, you know, really real and I, you know, thought, okay, you know, if, you know, as, as I got older and I th thought to myself, I can't, I can't keep keeping up this lie. I can't keep, you know, this lie is, is, is literally deteriorating my mental health. I need to actually stop lying and I need to be a lot more honest with myself about who I am. And I need to be more honest about who I am with other people. And once I did, once I fi finally started to come out, the fears that I had about being on the other side of that jump, being on the other side of that leap were you know, really melted away really, really quickly. And it was like jumping, you know, feeling like I was jumping off into like darkness and then realizing that it was only like, you know, six inches, you know, that, that, that jump. And, you know, once I crossed that Rubicon, my life got so much better and my life became so much easier. And the lies that I was telling, I could just let that go. And the, the the knots that I would put myself into mentally just, you know, got released. And so that idea of like, I can never go back to pretending to be something that I'm not. I can never go back to being in the closet again. I could never do that. I could never put myself through that. It's been, my life has been so much happier on this side. I could never undo that. I could never put that coat back on. I could never defile my feet after washing them. Got it. Yeah, that's really powerful, that connection between those lines. Have you been approaching writing a piece of music that is so vulnerable? Have you found that that's made it easier or more challenging or maybe a mix, mix of both? Well, I will say right off the bat, it has been with a lot of tears, like a lot of really, really raw emotions and a lot of, a lot of you know, exploring places emotionally that I, you know, was not necessarily ready to go. But in many ways, it has been really freeing, but it has also been incredibly intimidating because I, I want the music to match what I've been feeling, what I've been processing emotionally for the last, you know, since, you know, ever since coming out um, in 2018 and trying to find music to match that match what I am feeling and what I, what a relief it's been. Cause I, I would say this, the, the relief and the release of this has just been one of the one of the greatest, you know, moments of liberty in my life. And so trying to find music to match that has been uh, really intimidating and pretty challenging. And I should also point out that I have been working on this piece since 2020, you know, since the pandemic, when I was like, okay, well, I don't have anything else to do as a singer, so I guess I'll do more composing. And so I've been working on this, this idea for a long time. And in some cases, I've just had to say, I really don't know. I really don't know what musical language to use at this point. Um, so yeah, it's been intimidating, but it's also been really liberating, really freeing, but it's also, it's been plumbing the depths of my emotional capacity. Yeah. Well, I mean, 
I mean, I can understand that. I mean, that this sounds like this is, this is a piece that is about the core, very most core parts of you, all these, all these things coming together. Yeah. And also, I mean, and also I, I want to try and find a balance between this is really meant to be about going from self-loathing to self-love and going from denial to acceptance. But I also want to make sure that it doesn't feel like it focuses too much on the traumatic. I want it to be a lot more about the positivity and the healing that come from it. And that's a, that's a tough balance to, to find. Yeah, absolutely. When you sit down to compose and, and work on this piece, what are some tools or strategies that you use to work effectively? That's a good question. I know that you, uh, you just mentioned in your intro talking about demystifying, you know, composing. And I'm about, I'm about to add some mystery to it. I'm about to, <laughs> like, I'm about to, to chum those waters pretty thoroughly. I feel like with me, it all starts with, if I'm working on a choral composition, it really does all start with the text and has to, in many ways, come from a place of stillness and quiet. And I really do mean like quieting my, quieting my mind and allowing myself to really understand, you know, how would I, how does this line respond musically in my mind? And so I sort of imagine my mind being like a concert hall and I have to be able to hear the music in my mind, in this concert hall in my mind, before I'm actually able to sit down at a keyboard and write it. And so I, you know, I have a dog and I will go on walks with my dog. And while I'm on those walks, I will think about the text and I will sort of imagine these musical, these musical gestures as I'm walking. And where do they come from? I don't really know. I don't really have like a good answer for that. And I will say if I'm working on a text and I don't feel like the music is coming from this amorphous place, from, you know, this part, this concert hall in my mind, this imagination that sort of seems to come from chaos, I find that no amount of skill that I use can make up for the lack of inspiration. You know, there is a sort of idea of inspiration of, oh, something comes out of nothing. But then when you take that something, you can use the skill to extrapolate that and say, okay, let's take this, let's take this melody, let's take this gesture, let's take these harmonies, you know, let's, you know, put it into a different, let, let's reharmonize it, let's put it into a different, you know, uh, context, let's put it into a different character, let's change the texture, let's use retrograde, let's use inversion, let's use augmentation, let's use diminution. All those are the things that you can do, but there's no inspiration or nothing that you feel inspired by. For me, I have discovered, at least with myself, that there's no amount of my own skill that I can use to sort of like make it inspiring or like to make it something that I, you know, feel proud of. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the way that I talk about it with my students is that um, inspiration isn't so much the good ideas as much as it is what you care about and why. And if you don't care about something, if you don't have a reason for like, this is what it is that I'm trying to express, then of course you're going to struggle to say something. It's like, um, I'm sure we, everyone's been in those moments where you're in a conversation and then you get to that awkward silence where it's not awkward just because, you know, like there's a pause. It's awkward because I literally have no idea where to take this conversation, you know, and that's, I, I think, kind of what you're saying, right? Yeah. And I would say also that inspiration is not just, you know, thinking of the ideas, but also the inspiration of what to actually do with the ideas. You know, you have these certain set of skills that, right. you know, that we've, you know, come by these checklists of like, okay, let's try this, let's try this. Okay, but I want to try maybe this idea and do this and then it will relate with this way in this piece and then putting them in this order, that inspiration of like how to actually work with the material that you've imagined. Yeah. How does it develop? How does it grow? I mean, that, that is part of the meaning itself is that you have the initial idea, but it's what happens to the idea that is a lot of where the music happens. Totally. So whenever I get into a commission situation, I let the commissioning ensemble and the, the conductor know right off the bat, I'm happy to consider any texts that, you know, that come your way or that may come, you know, my way. And then making sure that we're both on the same page about a, a text. But if I get a text and I don't, if I, if, if I read it and I can hear music while I'm reading it, I know I can work with this. If I read a text and I don't hear any music, there's, I just say, we no, we have to choose something different. You know, it's not that the text is bad. It's not that the text is wrong. It's just not appropriate for the application. It's not something that I can work with. Maybe other composers can work with it. That's awesome. This is something that I've noticed is, um, you know, one of, one of my favorite composers is Rayfon Williams. And 
you know, he set quite a number of texts by Walt Whitman and lots of composers of text, you know, set, set texts by Walt Whitman. I can't do that. I, I look at a Walt Whitman text. I don't hear music when I read it. It's not that the poem is bad. It's not that Walt Whitman is a bad composer or sorry, a bad poet, but it's just that I, I don't respond to it the way that other people do. And I can't do that. You know, I mean, Vaughn Williams and Holst, you know, set and, and many like numerous other composers like, um, John Adams have set Walt Whitman in really incredibly poignant ways, in incredibly inspiring ways. I struggle with Whitman so much that I don't, I don't even bother. I don't even, you know, bother. I don't even entertain it anymore. Oh, that's totally fair. Maybe now things are different. Maybe if I looked, maybe if I looked at a Walt Whitman poem now, I, I might approach it differently. But for a long time, you know, I mean, like that actually came up. Like I was given a Walt Whitman poem and someone said, you know, we would love for you to write this to set this to music. And after, after nine months, I said, I can't do this. We've got to choose something else. Yeah, that makes sense. So I want to transition now. Uh, I want to transition now again. Actually, you know what I want to do? I want to back up a little bit and just say, so earlier on, you know, when you when we started having this conversation about, um, you know, strategies and tools that you use to compose, you're like, oh, I'm going to muddy the waters. But I was actually hearing a bunch of concrete things from you. And I'm, and I'm just going to enumerate them out of what I'm hearing and, you know, see, see if that identifies, uh, see if that draws out any more. So, you know, composition strategies and tools, go on a walk with your dog. So, you know, prerequisite to that is if you don't have a dog, you need to get a dog. You need to get a dog or, or a cat. Do you know how many great British composers owned cats and have taken pictures like with their cats? No, I, I don't. En enlighten me. Uh, well, you got Ray Fun Williams, then you got Benjamin Britten, you've got John Rutter, you've got James McMillan, you've got Tarek O'Regan. I mean, there are so many great British composers who just literally one of their official official portraits is them with a cat. So yeah, a dog or a cat. Dog or a cat. Okay, so get a dog or a cat, go on walks, but also, you know, really learning the text. I mean, this is particularly a choral thing of starting with the text, really getting the text into your mind and, in, and into your body and just getting a sense of how that text works and how it is that you respond to it. And then you mentioned a bunch of other tools of stuff in relation to, you know, you mentioned like retrograde and inversion and uh, all these other and reharmonization, all these other different um, uh, techniques as well. So, but the bottom line is when I was hearing you talk about these things, it's like, yeah, there, there is a, there is a core element of this, of just like, well, why am I responding musically? That part's the mystery, but the things that you're doing to, uh, resonate or draw out that musical response actually sounded pretty concrete to me. Well, that's good to know. Yeah, it's, it, but it is the matter of, okay, where does it, but where does it come from? That's the mystery for me is where does it, you know, how does it actually originate? How does it get in there? And also why, why does my mind respond? to one poem, but not to another. Well, this would be a conversation for another podcast where we get philosophical about things. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Where does the, where, do, what are the music of the spheres? Where does it come from? I have to know. Yeah. I mean, these are, these are big life questions. Now you're going to be joining us in the fall round of the Wizarding School for Composers, uh, doing a couple of things. I mean, you're going to be sharing insights from your 20 plus years of choral conducting and composing and performing. You're also organizing a small choir that students are going to have the opportunity to write for uh, and get their, get their choral pieces recorded. And so a couple questions in relation to this. First, why are you excited for this collaboration? I am really excited for this collaboration for a number of reasons. And one of them is because um, I am just really glad that there's so much emphasis put on composing for vocal ensembles because i feel i feel like i and you can tell me if i'm wrong but i felt like when i was um doing music uh music you know composition and theory and training you know there there's so much music written for the human voice in the renaissance and in the baroque you know and i think one of my professors told me there's actually more music written for the human voice than any other instrument or group of instruments and you know a lot of this because just of the untold mountains of music that you know we still are pulling out of, you know, churches in, in Europe and South America and Central America. And I feel like now there's, there's a little bit of like, okay, like 
you know, core, writing core music is for children. Writing core music is literally for children or for high schools or for just college choirs that just feel a little lovey-dovey. But if you want to write serious music, you know, choral music is not it. And I really hate that. And I am so glad to see that there's this idea of like, no, you can write really high art music for choral ensembles. Not only is there a market for it, not only is there a, a desire for it, but there are there are singers and ensembles throughout this world who are, you know, really, really, really good at taking on rep like this and want to take on rep like this and want to want to bring new music, you know, into to their audiences and just also to ourselves because you know we love we love you know i mean i love performing palestrina just as much as any any singer would or just you know renaissance music but it's also you know it's nice to to it's really um refreshing and revitalizing to be able to you know look at a composition and, and know that you're the first person to sing that you're the first person you're the first musician to lay eyes on that i you know i understand we were getting short on time but I sing at a church in Westwood, St. Paul the Apostle, and our uh, director, Jeff Parola, is a guy that I met at USC who was getting his doctorate in composition from USC. And one of the things that he does for us is he makes sure that like we are, com you know, he's composing something for the choir every week. It's usually just like a very small psalm setting, like an Anglican psalm or Anglican chant, you know, for the psalm. And that's really cool. I really love that. And I, you know, like knowing that like, oh, we, this is written just for us. This is brand new music and it's written in a really new and fresh way. And it's, you know, it, it harmonically, it doesn't, it doesn't, or, you know, you know, musically and harmonically, it doesn't dumb things down because it's, oh, it's for choir. It's for dummies. Right. Like it, it's, you know, it, it really stretches us, you know, musically and aesthetically. And I just, I just love that. And I love the idea of having a place that embraces that fully and is is willing and able to to show that yeah well i mean that's definitely one thing that i'm after in, in teaching this fall around at the wisdom school for composers you told a story i'm going to share a story too this uh this is going back to byu days so one of my professors at byu who you know was a man by the name of david Sargent. david Sargent uh, got his phd in music composition from eastman and when he was studying music composition, he wanted to write an orchestral piece. And his professor said, okay, yeah, you can write an orchestral piece, but first I need you to write a choir piece for me. And so, you know, David dutifully writes a, dutifully writes a choir piece. And then the professor's like, okay, that's great. Well, now write me another choir piece. And so after writing like a dozen choral pieces, then the professor's like, okay, you're ready to, you're ready to write an orchestral piece. I do think that there's some wisdom to that. I mean, obviously, there's a bunch of things about orchestration that you just simply do not learn when you're writing for choir. But if you can write effectively for choir, you can write very effectively for almost any ensemble. And so that's something that I'm, that I'm excited for, is, is that it's a really excellent gateway, both for developing as a composer. It makes a lot of the formal questions easier because unlike in instrumental music where you're just like, I have no idea what's going to happen next in choral music, it's like, well, here's a text. You don't necessarily know how much you're going to repeat these words or whether you're going to give them a or something, but you know that you're going to start here on the first word and end on the last word. So it makes the formal questions easier is another reason why I like uh, choral music. If I may, I will push back a little bit on that. Because, and that's, that's really great that the composition teacher at least had the idea of like, this is not something that you should neglect. You should get really good at this. What I don't necessarily like though, is that you sort of graduate from choral music, you know, and then like, okay, like you've graduated from choral music. Now you can move on to more complex things. I'm sure that's, I'm, you know, I, I'm not going to say that's what the professor meant. And I'm also not going to say that's what Dr. Dr. Sargent meant, but that is something that like, I hear pretty often, which is, you know, okay, like you can write choral music, but like, when, when are you going to start writing orchestral music? And I just kind of laughed to myself because, you know, people like Arvo Pert, they've never, you know, they've never graduated from choral music. Heinrich Goretzky never graduated from choral music. And I want to make sure that it's always seen as a sort of like, okay, it's just as much a legitimate art form, you know? And like I said, I'm sure that's not what Dr. Sargent meant. I just want to make sure that that's that that's, you know, sort of understood. Yeah, well, understood. Choral music is a legitimate <laughs> art form.
they're all legitimate art forms. Yeah. Well, thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, it's a pleasure as always. How can people learn more about you? And if they have questions, how can they get a hold of you? Yeah, you can uh, visit my website, www.mattnielsen.com. That's M A T T N I E L S E N.com. Uh, you can get all of my my compositions are there. My uh, some examples of me as a as a composer and a conductor, a baritone and a conductor are also there. And then I also have a a place where you can contact me on that website. Great. Well, thanks again for thanks again for joining me on the podcast today. Uh, it was a pleasure, and I look forward to seeing you in the fall. And any of the listeners who are listening to this, uh, who are going to be joining us, it's going to be a great time. It is going to be a great time. I'm really looking forward to the fall. Thanks again. All right. Take care, Matt. We'll talk later. Talk later. Take care.